this song? God is so good. Okay, make that. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He died for me. He died for me. He died for me. He died for me. Let us give all the glory to our God with this song, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things He had done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin.
to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious thee that grace appear the hour I first believe true man His word, my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, 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 praise God. sweet the sun that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now am found was blind but now I see my chains are Unending love, unending love from you. Amazing grace, your grace, oh God, is amazing to me. Your mercy, Lord, your mercy is new every morning, Lord. Unending love, unending love. Lord, you love us. Lord, you love us. Yes, oh Lord, you love us, Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, Lord. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I God who 
says we love you, we adore you, we worship you, we lift up our hearts to you, our voice, we sing to you, Almighty God, you are good, you are good all the time, all the time you are wonderful to us, so kind, so merciful and compassionate, so patient, oh God, we love Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we receive your love today. We receive your love today and give back to you all the praises. Lord, we give you back all the praises. We adore you. We love you, Lord. Lord, we drink in from heaven, from you, the living water. Lord, satisfy my heart with you, O Lord. Satisfy my heart with you, O God. Satisfy my soul with you. Satisfy my spirit with you, Lord. Oh, your love in me, O God. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love.
Father, we praise you and worship you. You alone deserve all glory and all honor. Lord, in our hearts, Lord, we just want to tell you how thankful we are that you have called us to be your very own. We give all glory, all honor to you, Lord. We are thankful for such a time as this, that, Lord, we can come together to worship you. Lord, together with one heart and one mind and in one spirit, Lord, to serve you this morning with our praises, with the offering of our lives, with the offering of our worship unto you, to declare that you are the only true God, Lord, and to lift up our nation unto you, to intercede, O oh God, to stand in the gap, Lord God, for many, Lord, who do not know you, for the life of our nation, for the destiny of our nation, and beyond our nation, Lord, even to nations, Lord God, we declare that you are the Lord of all. We declare that you deserve all the glory. Lord, we declare that, Lord, indeed you love, Lord, everyone, and you desire everyone, Lord, to know you. And you speak and pray at this time for your love, Lord God, to feel and touch every heart, Lord, in this world, Lord God. We pray that, Lord, their hearts will know that, Lord, you love them. Know that, Lord, you care for their, their lives, Lord God. You care for them. You care for us. Or even in your word, you say, cast all our cares to you because you care for us. Lord, you do. You care for us. You care for the nations, Lord God. You care about every area. Lord, in our nation and in all nations that is in this world, Lord God. Lord, you care. You truly care, Lord God. And so, Lord, we believe as we cry out from our hearts, you hear the prayer that we utter. Lord, whether it's with our own voice or it's just inside our heart, in our mind, Lord, hear the cry of our heart, O oh Lord. Hear the cry of our heart. Hear my cry, O Lord, attend until my prayer, interceding for our land. Send your mercy, send your power, bringing healing to our land. Hear my cry. Attend unto my prayer, Father, unite us as one. In your mercy, in your power, Father, glorify your name. Day and night, I see. I cry out for your mercy, send your glory, Lord. Day and night, I seek your face. Father, let your holy fire consume this sacrifice. Lord, revive us once again. cry, O oh Lord, attend unto my prayer, interceding for our land. Send your mercy, send your power, bringing healing to our land. Hear my cry, O oh Attend unto my prayer, Father, unite us as one. In your mercy, in your power, Father, glorify your name. Day and night, I 
seek your face as I cry out for your mercy. Send your glory, Lord, day and night. I seek your face. Father, let your holy fire consume this sacrifice. Revive us, Lord, once again. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. First and foremost, I'd like to wish all mothers a very happy Mother's Day today. Let us come to the Lord in prayer before we look at the words of God. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, that you have blessed us with mothers through whom oh lord that you have allowed us to experience your love father we want to pray this morning for a blessing upon all our mothers we pray that oh god that may you pour out your love upon them may you grant them your comfort and your strength in availing themselves as a channel of love to the children whom you have blessed them with, both biologically and those whom you have entrusted to them to care for spiritually. Father, we just pray, O oh Lord, that would you be with us on this Mother's Day. Lord, as we look to you for your words, as we look to you for comfort and for guidance from your words, Lord, we pray, O oh God, that you help us to remember how we have used mothers in our life to guide us, to lead us, to nurture us, to protect us, to shape us. Therefore, we want to give thanks to you, Lord, for all the mothers, for our mothers. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we come to listen and to hear your words, may you bless us with your understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue on on this whole topic on reset. Some of us may have used computer. You know that sometimes we are forced to restart a computer software or program. You know when you press the button and force quit or force restart to to restart the computer, restart the program. Normally there will 
there will be a uh, notice, a note that came out that says that, you know, are you, are you sure you want to continue with this action? Because whatever, when you do that, whatever that you have done, it will not be safe. It cannot be safe. The, the whole episode that we are going through, an unprecedented experience that we are going through right now, not only just in our nation, but also in the nations of the world, affecting the whole world. I look at it, it is more, this is more like a false start. Nobody wanted, you know, a reset to happen in that way, in a very uncomfortable way, in a very inconvenient way, in, in a very difficult way. It is as if well that it was necessary, as if well that God has has come to a point that that is the only way to save, to, to give the, the world an, another opportunity to respond to His love, to respond to His values, to respond to His words. And that is to have a false restart. This morning, I'd like to share with us on this topic, reset. We talk about reset, like going to going back to the beginning or, or going to a new beginning. And I like to say to us that you know, when whenever God does a, a work of restarting or resetting in the scriptures, as you see, it is not always going back to the good old ways. Reset this morning, I will share with us, but not the good old ways. Now, as I mentioned up just now, four star talks about there's no time to save in everything, something will be lost. Now, when we are working halfway and the computer crash and we need to quit, uh, force quit it, restart it, force for it. And some of the works that we have done, if we are not saving and we are still doing it, and perhaps it is exactly the things that we were doing, the part of the program that when we, when we were using, uh, we were working on before that crash came about. Now that part cannot be saved. You know, that it, it is better for it to go. Something will be lost. I'd like to draw our attention to the Word of God in Numbers chapter 11, verse 4 to 10. Let's read this together. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? To eat? Remember, we remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its color like the color of Berlin. The people went about and gathered it, ground it on milestones, or beat it in the mortar, cook it in pans, and make cakes of it. And its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And when the dew fell on the can in the night, the manna fell on it. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses was also, also was displeased. Now this is a story about the people of Israel. They were, they were being delivered from Egypt. In Egypt, they were slaves. And uh, they were they were forced to to work in a condition that is that was not conducive. The Lord delivered them because the Lord heard their cry. God heard their cry. The scripture tells us in Exodus that God heard their cry and decided to 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 extend His grace and mercy to His people and deliver them from the Egypt at that particular point of time. And when they came up in a miraculous way, Passover, we just, we just celebrated Passover a couple of weeks ago, I mean, a few weeks ago, and, uh, and, and they walked through the Red Sea on dry ground, miracles after miracles. And they came to a place, they were, they were confronted with the harsh challenge and environment of the desert. And you can imagine the, the desert, how is it like? No water and uh, no food. You can't plant. They're they not meant to be 
doing any planting or any agriculture activities. They were just wandering in the desert on the way to the promised land. But in between, during that period of time, hardship came. And therefore, the scripture tells us that now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. Now, first of all, I'd like to highlight to us that this, uh, this part of the scripture talks about mixed multitude. Why mixed multitude? It simply means that among the people of Israel at that point of time, even when we in the desert, they were foreigners. There were those who there was those who believed in the word of Yahweh, the word of the God of Israel. Those who perhaps participated, I'm not sure, but perhaps participated in the Passover feast. And at, at, the, at the exodus of the people of Israel from Egypt, they joined in. Therefore, there was a mixed um, multitude, right? And what happened to, uh, to this mixed multitude was just that they yielded to intense craving. But what did they crave for? They crave for meat to eat. And uh, in particular, fish, uh, which we ate freely in Egypt. Freely doesn't mean that uh, free of charge, but they were plentiful. If you remember that the people of Israel, when they left Egypt, they took along a lot of uh, cattle, you know, uh, herds, and so on and so forth, animals with them. The very reason that they were still craving for meat suggests to us that those animals which they brought up from Egypt, they couldn't eat it, right? For perhaps for two simple reasons. Number one, for cattle, for animals such as uh, camels, you know, probably they need to use it for transportation, they need to use them. And for cows, you need the milk, and so are, uh, so is it with sheep and goats. You need the milk, you need the fur, and so on. Secondly, they couldn't eat it because Perhaps some of these animals was meant to be for sacrifice in worship, right? In worship. So it was it was set aside for sacrifice. Now for this simple two reason, therefore, even though they have animals with them, they couldn't eat. Now, and then they also remember the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic, and the good old days. Now, the good old days and there's nothing at all except in this manner before our eyes and those were the good old days now we have this manner this miraculous manner that haven't 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 seen it anywhere in uh, in in our in their lives before and fell from the sky and every night along with the dew and once you cook it it is it has a taste of pastry prepared with oil like roti chanai perhaps it is every day you can you can cook it in that way you can probably uh, boil it i don't know but but it is it sounds like very tasty and obviously very nutritious and i believe now so they were not happy with these new things that they were having they were so used to the old normals that when they were forced out of them they were being forced out of the old normals, which was not an entirely pleasant experience. I mean, the old normals, though they have meat to eat, they have uh, uh, cucumbers, melons, and all the rest of it that they have mentioned in this part of the scriptures. But they were slaves. There was something, there was something that was more important, that was weightier, that the Lord was delivering them from, taking them up from. So they were yearning and long for the old normals. Nothing wrong with yearning for all this good food, nothing wrong at all. And now they are, they are faced with the new normal, the manna and all that. And they were happy. And they say that, wow, how, I, how we long for the days in Egypt. What? In the, during the days, during their days in Egypt, they were slaves, right? They were slaves, they had no freedom. But yet, because of the intense craving in their heart, they've forgotten, or rather they have not forgotten, but they look at the past, they 
they romanticize the past. And actually, it was not like that. Though they have fish to eat, though they have meat to eat, perhaps, though they have cucumbers, melons, onions, garlics, and all these vegetables, freely, easily available to them, but yet they were not free. They were not free to be what God has created them to be, has called them to be. And God to do something to forcefully take them out of that situation, to give them a new start, a new beginning, a new normal, which is still largely uncomfortable. Now, when I talk about not to return to the good old ways, I'm not saying that we should not yearn for to go back to the old normals to be able to to go back to our work, to go back to our job, to uh, to contribute to society, to go back to the worship services like we used to have, to fellowship, to be able to uh, eat freely with our friends at coffee shop and restaurants. I'm not talking about not able, not not wanting to go back to restart our business. You know, to to uh, to build career and so on and so forth. I'm not talking about all. I'm talking about something that is in our so-called normal in the past. Something that could have a hold on our lives. Let's look at what it meant for the people of Israel in this time. So, not to return to the good old ways. What are these good old ways? These good old ways are. Number one, the ways of Egypt. The ways of Egypt is is there are the ways of worship. It is, it is a different system altogether. The ways of Egypt is a way of idolatry. Is a way of worshiping human being as God because the Egyptians look upon Pharaoh as a, and and deities and deities him and consider him as not only their political leader but also a spiritual leader. The ways of Egypt is has has no regard of uh, of human lives. They enslaved the whole people of Israel, and they kept them at such a state. How long? I believe that they were planning to do it perpetually forever. The ways of Egypt also speaks of, as I mentioned. Worship. They were not allowed to worship God in the way that that Yahweh, the God of Israel, has prescribed to the people of Israel. And therefore, and therefore, they were, uh, they were. God was talking to Pharaoh and to Moses and said, "Let my people go, so that they may go into the wilderness and serve me and worship me." For that reason, the ways of Egypt is a ways of. Of that, 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 uh, that, uh, that keep God's people away from worshiping Him. There may be things in our past. I mean, past is like just a few months ago, 2019. There may be pressure in life that is so intense, demand in life, distraction, and oppression and intimidation from the enemy that keep us away from worshiping our God, your God. Your Jesus, my Jesus, to keep us away from being faithful to Him. Those are the ways in the past. Those are the ways that is anti God, against God's way. Hinder us from drawing close to Him. Hinder us from developing intimacy with God. And all this perhaps is was part of a part of our past. To reset, to go back, to return to normalcy, but not to the way, to the things that hinder us, that that draw us away from God. Number two, they were craving for meat. That is the ways of the flesh. Craving is in the flesh. You see, as I mentioned just now, that their past can be described. Yes, they have food, make freely available. To them, they have, they have to, they have to work for it, they have to toil for it, they have to slave for it. But those are what they get. But in return, for you know, for getting this food, they were enslaved 
They were enslaved and God set them free. When they look back into their past, they begin to weigh you know, the benefits of all the good food that they have. No, no need to worry about where the food is going to come from. They were farmers in the land of Egypt. They will provide all this. And the state of their life, being slave, no freedom, no status, no voice in a nation that they call home and Egypt. Weighing between these two, they did not express thanksgiving to the Lord for setting them free from slavery, but yet again they crave for that appeal to the flesh. When we we start, when we we open our activities, there will be there will be changes, of course. What do we long to return to? Do we long to return to the way that we used to gratify our flesh in the things that is ungodly, in the in the in the things that is in the, in the way that is selfish, not considering the interests of others and only considering the, our own interests? Craving in the flesh is something that we have been um, disciplined during this period of time. Not to, not to have access to that. And when we return to so-called the normalcy, normalcy that we, we, that we know, do we long to return entirely, you know, entirely as the Malaysian bulak bulak, going back to our past, returning to our old ways? I suggest that some, some of the things in the past is best left in the past. Some of the way of uh, our our ways of conducting our lives, our relationship, and so on, is best to be left behind. As I mentioned at the start of my sharing, is this that this reset? The way I look at it is more like a false reset. We can't save everything. Something will something will be lost, and it is it was it is necessary for us to do that in order for us to go into the new beginning, the new future. The third, the third always that we should not return to the ways of the world the ways that the world thinks the ways that the philosophy and the thinking of the world around us so here we see that the the, the people of Israel greatly influenced by uh, those who have intense craving, they yield to intense craving. Intense craving is one thing, but the scripture tells us that the Bible was this that they yield, they yielded to the intense craving. The way of the world is is anti-God. The way of the world, the way that we conduct business, the way that we look at our nation, the way that we 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 relate to our associates in business, the way that we relate to one another, the way of the world places no value on human being. And therefore, I'd like to suggest to us that when we return to the normalcy as we have known it in the past, it may be slightly different. What is the normalcy that you long to return to? Long to return to having lunch at Damai, singing together, close by, joining up the tables, wherever we go. That is fun because we long for fellowship. But you know, something has to change. Along the way, something needs to change. I'm just wondering the, how the church ministry is going to look like. Can we, how does this? Uh, uh, social distancing work. Take for instance in a counselling situation, in a prayer ministry situation, in a deliverance situation. How how does social distancing work? And in the way that we we relate to one another, how does all this restriction going to work? How in the way that we relate to perhaps elderly people, people who are who are sick with uh, chronic sicknesses 
Can we visit them? Can we lay hands on them and they'll pray for them? Can we visit them in the hospital? Can we visit them in the homes? What about home communion? Going to a home to have communion, to minister the Holy Communion to people who, who cannot, because of the physical condition, come out of the home to fellowship with God, with God's people. What is it going to be like? For churches, not talking about our church, but talking about churches around Malaysia, around, around the world, around this, this region, where the members' income has dropped, has reduced, and to the, to the extent that they cannot afford to keep renting the church premise. What happened to those churches? Does it mean that they have to close down? This is a serious question that we need to answer. What about members who are really finding so difficult to put food on the table in the next six months, in the next one year, perhaps even in the next two years? What will happen? What will happen when more and more people cannot find work or cannot earn sufficient to put food on the table? When the MCO is lifted, would crime rates would crime rates increase? Now all these kind of questions that we we need to grapple, we need to struggle with. And that is perhaps, realistically speaking, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to look at that is perhaps the new normal or part of the new normal. What about our meetings over Facebook, online, video conferencing, and all the rest of it? How many of of our Christian population actually have access to all these tools. How are we going to reach out to them? How are we going to touch lives? How are we going to educate our children? If schools are slow to open up, will parents be afraid to send their children back to school? All these questions we need to grapple with by their parents. I want to suggest to us that these three things that we can embark on. Number one is that we need to filter out what is ungodly in the past. In our past, what is ungodly? We probably need to filter that out and say that that is a part that I don't want it anymore. But I mean un- ungodly and I like to uh, begin with two levels. One is at our personal level, our relationship with the Lord. Anything that is ungodly. Let us continue to seek the Lord and say, Lord, how do you want me to live this new life in this time? Anything that is ungodly in my in my thinking, in my attitude, in my relationship with you. Lord, I want to lay it down. I want to surrender it and lay it down at your feet. Now these are some of the things that we probably need to look at. Number two, to embrace the new godliness as the new norm. As I mentioned, the way that we we uh, we relate to one another, we, we, we disciple the people of God. The way that we minister to those who need Jesus, it will be entirely different. And what about those people, as I mentioned, that find it difficult to make ends meet? Their income is affected, and they are out of job, children need, need to be fed, and so on. And those are the times, those are the, these are the times that force us to be, to look at what are the bare essential that we need to focus on. I say bare essential, not bare necessity. Bare necessity may drive us to focus on perhaps what we need physically. Yes, that is important. That is certainly a part of um, a part of uh, the uh, the focus we need to put in. But I talk about bare essential because what is really important in life, this new godliness. Because you see, in in the life of God's people, it throughout Scripture, throughout the history of the church, how do we get protected? How do we get provided? How do we experience the provision and the protection of God? It is when we choose to live in godliness. 
Godliness is the key to our success. Godliness is the key for us to avail protection, provision from the Lord. This morning in our uh, church bulletin front page, I quoted an example about Elijah. In brief, I talk about the, uh, the encounter of Elijah in 1 Kings 17. Elijah was going through a period of uh, famine in the land of Israel for three years. But the Lord miraculously provided for Elijah. And through unlikely means, in fact, the most unlikely means for him. Why? Because his relationship was right with God. It, is, it, is, it was regardless of the circumstances that he was in, but because of the godliness of Elijah, because of a godly life that Elijah lives, that, the, that he stepped into, he stepped, he walked right into provision and protection in throughout the three years of family. I want to encourage all of us, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in this coming maybe three years, two years. Let us focus our eyes on Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on our Heavenly Father. Let us draw near to, to Him and, 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 and rely on Him on perfect, on, on, uh, for protection and for provision. And so, I'd like to suggest to us godliness, this new godliness, how to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord when we have to go around wearing masks, when we need to practice social distancing, and perhaps we also need to continue to meet such as this online. And so in our world, you know, that, uh, that the, the rate of production and productivity will, will inevitably be affected in some way and therefore profit will probably drop. When profit drops and profit is being reduced, or at least during this period of time, that enterprises, businesses are trying to adjust to this new normal. There will be a lot of sacrifices. There will be a lot of there will be a lot of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of people of of finding are uh, facing pressure, financial pressure. In times such as this, I want to encourage you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, trust in the God of Israel. Trust in the God of Israel. Trust in the God of Elijah. Trust in your God, my God, our Father. Thirdly, Habakkuk 2, 4, B, the second part. He says that, but the righteous shall live by his faith. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, righteous refers to people whose relationship is right with God. Not just living a perfect life, not just living a good life, not just living, uh, you know, sometimes you say righteous upright has to do with uprightness, true, but righteousness speaks more than just our action, our deeds, our thoughts, our words, but our relationship with our God. The righteous are those who are in right relationship with God. And the word says, shall live by His faith. Shall live by His faith. By his faith in God, yes, by his faith in the finished work of the cross of Jesus, the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That too is part of his faith that we talk about. The word shall live in the Hebrew words is Kaya. You know, there's a hotel in KK called Kaya Hotel. By the way, it's, uh, it's pronounced Kaya, it's not Chaya. And so, Kaya means that not only to live, to survive, to be preserved, but to prosper. To prosper and to use fruit, to be fruitful. Shall live doesn't mean that just to survive, but in the midst of all these challenges, financial, emotional, spiritual challenges that we are walking into post-MCO, I call it. It's real, they are, they're all real. But in the midst of all this, we shall, we shall live, we shall kaya. We should not only survive, but we should prosper. We shall be fruitful. 
Now that is the hope that we can have in God, in Jesus. I'd like to encourage all of us during this time that we there may be a lot of things going on, going through in our mind. And I'd like to suggest to us that let us lay down all this during this time and begin to lift up our eyes and fix our eyes on our Heavenly Father. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, O Lord, that you are the God who never changes. You were the same yesterday and you're the same today and you are going to be the same forever. Father, as we look through how you have demonstrated your grace and your mercy to your people Israel, to Elijah, to the church, to all of us here individually at some point in our life. Father, let it be an encouragement to us from the testimony of your words, from the testimony of your people, that we may look into this path that we have never journeyed before ahead of us, that we will not give up hope, that Lord, that we will not give up on you because you have not given up on us. No matter how challenging it is in the months, in a couple of years to come, Father, I pray, O oh God, that you will never let us go. I pray that, Lord, that you will never allow us to let you go. Would you strengthen us when we are weak, that we may continue to hold on to you, to look to you, to look for that miraculous intervention in our lives, for provision, for protection, not only for our, for our lives, for our own, for ourselves, but also for all your household, for the household of God, for the, those people who will turn their hearts towards you. Father, hear our prayers, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Shalom, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Once again, I'd like to wish all mothers a very happy and blessed Mother's Day. And there are a few announcements I'd like to highlight to all of us. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for banking in your tie and your offering. And that has been very helpful. We'd like to, we'd like to encourage you to continue to do so as part of our worship unto the Lord. And for those of us who have contributed uh, money to Food Aid, we also want to say thank you and, and acknowledge that because of that, many families have been helped. As the MCO is slowly lifted off and we find that the needs for, uh, for food aid may be limited in the coming months. We do not know how it's going to be light in the next few months' time. So for the time being, uh, for this month, uh, we have sufficient money to, to help those who are in need of food. Thank you very much. This coming Tuesday, we continue on with our power station which starts on seven, it starts at 7 o'clock until 10 o'clock at night. Please do get uh, the link to log into our, our power station from Jonathan. If you have difficulty of listening or hearing or logging in, please let uh, somebody else uh, know or your cell leader so that we will be able to help you to do so. I'd like to also highlight to us that uh, the the church in Kuala Lumpur, the Gereja Anglican Sumu Hidup, was burned down uh, about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're in the process of rebuilding the church, and if any one of you who, who feels the burden and has the conviction to give to the rebuilding of this church, please let us know so that we can channel that money to the diocesan office. Let us come before the Lord and receive the blessing of the Lord. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and mind in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
everyone. Have a very blessed week ahead. Thank you.